thought we might have some folks that have um, you know, been working in the law. Um, Alexander um, is uh, at Twitter as their general counsel. Um, formerly, he was at Google, and among his other accomplishments, he wrote the Google Book Settlement um, documents, um, or was one of the lawyers involved in that. And whether you agree with that or not, um, as Larry Nesson said, it's an amazing piece of lawyering. Um, really well done. Um, and then Professor Baring, um, as I said before, is a past president of the American Association of Law Libraries, um, one of the noted experts on legal research and how to do it. He's taught generations of students at, at Bolt Hall. And I asked him to speak today about lawyers and access to the law. What is it the lawyers want? Are there impediments? What, what do they think of these, these general concepts? And so I will turn it over to you folks, and you can decide who goes first. Yeah, I'll go, uh, I'll go first, and I'm going to be shorter. Um, I think that so the um, uh, so how many of you are in-house legal practitioners? I think I might be the only one. Uh, lawyers who are in-house, yeah, I think I'm the only one. So uh, I think that's part of why Carl wanted me to talk, which is just I think we talk a lot about the cost as being prohibitive for something like Westlaw um, or, or Lexis for for nonprofits. Certainly, people know know a lot about that. We talk about it in the in the government space. Um, that it's, it's often prohibitive. Of course, the academic space, you all have got great deals, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> um, and no one has any, um, uh, no one has any uh, um, concern for people at law firms, so we can sort of leave them out of it. <laughs> um, but uh, but the, one of the realities of, of, uh, of in-house, particularly small in-house practice, and you look at a lot of the companies that are in the legal headlines, um, today other than uh, some of the bigger ones like Facebook, but you look at like a Scribd or um, uh, any of the little uh, user-generated content sites that actually a lot of their businesses, uh, the, the law is quite important to and the law um, influences in a big way. And those legal departments are likely either zero people or one person, and the budgets are very, very small. Um, so uh, to give you an example, when I started Twitter, I was the only uh, lawyer there, and um, we were looking at uh, subscribing to, to Westlaw. The first quotation we got from them was $5,000 um, a month. Uh, we said, come on, please, please, please. Uh, and they said, OK, uh, you know, the magic word gets you, I think, to like $3,000 or $1,000 a month. Um, we did get it down, and we did try to get the like, come on, you, don't you want to say Twitter's using you uh, type of discount? Um, <laughs> Uh, which works uh, sometimes. Um, um, yeah, I keep telling people that uh, when they ask about Twitter, we, we've engaged with a bunch of nonprofits that sort of our first job with respect to nonprofits is making it so that we are not one, um, because currently we are and we would like to not be. Um, but the, the, um, the choice at the end of the day, for me, uh, it was not cost effective to have access to case law, um, which uh, is kind of crazy when you think about um, an attorney at a company that's not dirt poor, um, but there just was no way for me to justify as to the other expenses that I had um, a subscription to one of those services. And the, the biggest uh, thing that I would be using it for, because obviously if you're in-house you do rely a lot on outside counsel um, for a lot of stuff, but you look at keeping up to date on cases in your area of either expertise or your forced uh, knowledge um, is very, very hard to do on a small budget. Um, understanding some of the, the, uh, um, the, the essays and scholarship on it is actually easier because so much of that is now published in, in terms of blogs or even on, on Twitter. But actually getting access to the underlying primary materials remains uh, difficult, um, especially some of this, the, uh, the state or, or other types of materials, and getting access to them in a, a timely way, in a way that you can rely on the content, in a, relay, in a way that you can discuss with your attorney, your outside attorney, um, in terms of the particular paragraph or whatever that you want to talk about in terms of a case. All of that stuff is hard, so it's one of the many reasons why I've been um, uh, very happy to see you know, Carl leading the, the charge here. Um, the one other thing I want to talk about from the from the Twitter perspective is uh, the focus on on the timeliness of some of this information and the incredible uh, opportunity for uh, even a short amount a short lag of time 
to be destructive in terms of the value of the information. And the, the easiest example that came to mind, uh, to my mind at least, was a case that, had, that would have an impact on the stock value of a company. And of course, those, those cases, um, there is a tremendous premium on getting those cases quickly and understanding them. And even a three or four hour lag would be a very big deal there. So the more we can do to actually get this, uh, the case law into the hands of people um, who can dissect it, analyze it, parse it, spread it, uh, the better. Um, and that's certainly something that, that, uh, that we at Twitter have learned in terms of the value of really, really timely um, information, even if it's short. The last thing I would say is that um, uh, in the even if it's short category, um, is that certainly Twitter isn't in the legal case business. You couldn't fit uh, most legal decisions in the tweet. Um, Maybe we should. Uh, it's a dangerous, uh, dangerous thing. But, um, uh, but I have been talking with some folks about the way in which both uh, governments um, and uh, uh, lawyers and courts have been using Twitter to spread information about their cases. And uh, if, you, if you think about this from a code perspective, you could even imagine that um, a, like a, a statute would actually have a Twitter account so that it could tweet out when um, an interesting revision happened. And again, this is not that different from an RSS feed except for the benefit of being able to be quickly retweeted and passed to the people that, um, that are for which the update will be important. Anyway, with that, I'll leave the questions and talk. Uh, you know, in a way, I feel as if uh, I'm a visitor from another time. <laughs> uh, when we started teaching advanced legal research, it was 1982. Um, and one of the things that concerned me was that people were not interested in the legitimacy of the information that they used and that they didn't have a global understanding of how it was assembled and what a judicial opinion really was and what a statute was or, or code compilation or administrative rule or regulation. Um, obviously, the world has entirely changed, but I, I think one of the things uh, to directly answer the question that was posed, the law students that I see and we teach advanced legal research at Berkeley. Michael Levy, who's here, and Kathleen Vanden Heuvel and I do it. This year, between the two semesters, we had about 160 students. So we're seeing half of the Berkeley law students as they go through. And what they look for right now is uh, they want something that they can rely on, uh, something that they can trust. And uh, back in the ancient days, when I started out, that was not a question. The question of the legitimacy of information was not something that anyone Posed. Uh, you did not ask if the book of reports was legit or durable or the, the code that you were using or the administrative report that you were reading the loose leaf service. The idea that it wasn't uh, legitimate, authenticated, durable didn't occur. They, might, they were actually legitimate questions and, and I challenged some of the publishers at the time. By the way, I should say, I know I've stumbled across this, I'm not working for any publisher. I've worked for them all at some point, but no more. Um, so that, uh, so um, I, I think that unthinking legitimacy, and that's something I've tried to play with in my work and in my teaching and in my thinking, what is it that creates that feeling of trust that you can use a product and that you believe that it is giving you a definitive answer, that it's really holding the bag um, in the end. If something goes wrong, that you did the right stuff to take yourself to that source and employ that source. Um, Dan Dabney uh, calls it research psychosis. You know, he, can, he says that what Lexis and Westlaw have done to a lot of law students is they've made them psychotic when it comes to research <laughs> because there isn't a single place to go look for something. Now there's two. Uh, when I started out, <laughs> you could shepherdize and you were safe. And even if shepherds was wrong, you used shepherds. It was like an amulet to a vampire. You know, it's, I used shepherds. What else could you do? Well, now you should have keysighted. Um, so, but it's spreading further and further out. And so I think that the, the reality base, would, it used to be these sets of books in the library. For the typical student now, it is Lexis and Westlaw uh, because they've got the boots on the ground and they do the first year research training in most law schools. Uh, I pose a question, I've used the same template every semester for probably 10 years with the student, well, more and more in recent years, uh, where I give the students uh, a recent, judicial decision, and I say, uh, go look this up and read it on Lexis, uh, go 
read it on Westlaw, and then find me three uh, free websites where you found the case. And uh, what's different about it? Write a book review. Why would you trust one? Why would you not trust one? And so I just created a, a whole bunch of these, and I got to see the back. And I can drive people to use uh, LII. I, uh, people used FindLaw. People used Justicia. People used, I mean, you name it. Um, but they all, although some of them like the, the other products, you know, they, they carry with them this feeling of paranoia that uh, some of the links don't work. Uh, I mean, I write on the papers. These, you know, these folks are doing their best. <laughs> but, you know, they can't have the bells and whistles. Uh, they don't have the 800 number to call. They don't have the feet on the ground. Um, I actually, it's funny, uh, it, well, two, two thoughts occurred to me today. Um, one of them is that there's a, another side to this entire issue, and that is uh, those of us who teach legal research, I think, are all aware of Bloomberg. Um, Bloomberg is definitely wants to be a player now, and given that Michael Bloomberg apparently is the prince of New York City now, <laughs> he gets to rule as long as he wants, and he has all the money in the world, and they're actually starting to put boots on the ground, and they wanted to come into our ALR class, and they gave out free numbers. So in fact, there might be more competition at the high end on this reality base. And I know we're talking about law students, and I know we're talking about expensive services, that maybe they could cut you a deal, get it to you for 3,000 instead of 5,000. Um, but there's high end competition here too. The other question that occurred to me on this legitimacy factor, though, is I, I often try to pose questions to myself as my, when my sons were like eight or 10 years old, as they would have posed to me. Because at heart, what Carl is working on is a 10-year-old's question. And that is, the government has law, and we're all supposed to obey the law, so the government should make the law available to us. I mean, really, and it's a 10-year-old's proposition. It's so simple that it, it's kind of stunning when you think about it in that sense. Why don't they do it? And I think, I really love the, the article that you gave me um, that was mentioned this morning um, about the early reports, the decisions and the reporting. The government, in my view, I'm very cynical about this, has never assumed responsibility for the production of information about it's, it's the law. Uh, it, it, it didn't do it early on. The, the fed, lower federal courts have never done it. Um, some states took it up. They, they left it up, and I guess in a way created a platform, as Tim would have said, by Wheaton versus Peters and saying that there's no copyright, but they invited in the private sector, and the private sector just did a better job and made this stuff available and pervasive and beat each other out of the market. And you know, I came up in the world when ben, Bancroft Whitney was the official reporter California, you know, got gobbled up and eaten up uh, by the competition within the market. And as the government tries to pr provide information and tries to make it available, it just reaches this incredible nest of problems of uh, coming up with, we're solved in paper, a uh, universal citation system that everybody understood and you could use in every place, a template for the way a judicial opinion appeared. Um, standardization of codes, and even administrative rules and regulations, even these municipal codes, which we work through at ALR, you see them, you know, and as Eric has said, a lot of them have the same template so that they become much easier to use. Um, I think that it, that's coming from the outside, and I just don't see the energy or the uh, will within the government and given the changing waves of politics, uh, how this is going to happen. And you also have the problem of judges. I've spoke, you know, I assume you your law being the judicial council and uh, various state judiciaries, but judges are godlike figures. And uh, they take their roles very seriously and they don't like to do what they're told. And so that each district court is gonna have its own view and the state courts have their own view and they can live in the universe and they're mostly in my generations, you know? Sad to say. And so they tend to have come from a world where they understand the information system. And so why should they switch? I've spoken to the national uh, Clerks of court, state clerks of court, um, and or court reporters, state court reporters. Incredibly conservative. I mean, they were hostile to. I mean, they were hostile to me because they thought that I was one of these people who wanted to take away their ability to do everything just the way they wanted to and put some template. This is over in the great citation battles. Um, I think it has to change. I very much agree with the with Secretary Saint Bowen that uh, eventually time and energy will catch up here. But right now, what the law students want is someone who's holding the bag. And when um, I had them look at LII, or use, if they use fine law, uh, or anything like that, uh, they didn't feel that that was a place where they could plunk down their nickel and say, I bet my career on this, or I totally rely on this. And, and is it maybe that they should look past some of the glitz and ease of use? 
maybe, but it is their perception. And I've seen Westlaw Next, is that what they're calling it? I haven't seen Alexis, but I, as you, everybody probably has here, I mean, it looks a lot like Google. Um, I mean, everybody is moving towards that because they want to be, they want to be familiar. They want it to be a familiar, uh, reliable, cognitive authority and base. Uh, so I remain worried. I, I, I cheer you on, truly. I'm not being sarcastic. I, I, I think Carl is fighting the fight of the just here. I mean, I look at some a place like Australia, where Graham Greenleaf, another one of my heroes, you know, Australia really did fix this. And, and the Canadians have done a great job of fixing this. And I wonder, is it just because of the size of the jurisdiction? That somebody got everybody organized? Is it because of the, same, the different structure of the court systems, uh, different historical traditions? But in the United States, there's been so much investment in and ownership of the way you do things and the way that your information is sometimes hoarded or guarded or, or reported or just comfortably produced. Again, Secretary of State Bowen's examples of people just afraid of what might happen and they want to stay with what they know and what they are accustomed to using and that they don't want to change. So I, the answer to the question of what do law students want, and I think most re legal research is done by younger lawyers. I get if you're in solo practice or if you're a solo in-house counsel, then it's going to be a different world. But a lot of the people we teach, even if they go to state agencies or non-governmental organizations, um, uh, research is very heavy in the early years. And the people that are passing through the halls right now are people who do want to use systems that are easy, um, seamless, but that in their heart they feel they can lean on it. And that in the end, the reality base might be they check both Lexus and Westlaw. Um, but I think that they're, you know, they have not, getting, and I don't, as I said, I don't understand the, the, the magic formula that creates a cognitive authority. It would make everybody in this room believe if I went to SCOTUS and then linked from SCOTUS to a case, I'm fine. And the last thing I'll say is I was at one of my aha moments was last summer I spoke at the Bob Oakley Memorial symposium in, in DC on authentication of information and Tom Goldstein showed up who I've been reading about from SCOTUS who all my students and their assignments now in SCOTUS and what one of the themes of the program was authentication of information and so the person who was running the panel said you know well, what's your view how how do you go about authenticating your information and he said oh we don't authenticate anything <laughs> uh, that's a, I think the Law Library Congress might be doing that. I'm not sure, but that's not what we do. We provide, we get information out there fast, and we hook you up to something little tell you what it is. And um, you know, that's for all of the, the great reputation that it has, and the great information it provides. It's just not in that business. And so I think that's a huge challenge. And, and I don't know how you get over that, whether it's popular culture or it's inevitable because of the change in generations, or you're going to have to sell a lot of state legislatures, or you're going to have to take out ads in the Super Bowl. Um, but you got to make people believe that some new tool that's gathered together is something that they can rely on and bet their career. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I mean, I just sort of follow up on that. I mean, I think that, well, a couple of things. First, I think there's a lot of free information right now on the internet, which might not be case law, which is certainly worthwhile. Some things, for example, uh, the SEC documents, which came out. Well, there's a lot of good contract language in there. I know that we were at Fine Law that we used to use the SEC contracts to negotiate our own deals, and now uh, uh, one CLE, uh, another site that Ken Chan in our office runs. Lots of contracts all broken down. There's a lease agreement. Uh, you know, Bart Rothschild and runs Nanosolar now, to be Fine Law founder, uh, used it for doing sort of university licensing. Found the actual deal terms written by really top lawyers, and it's something that's a little bit outside of the uh, scope of case law, but certainly there. So I think that if you look at the internet from a, a lawyer's uh, you know, practitioner level, there's a lot of things you still can find out there, so you're always going to sort of use them. Um, the case law part, in the codes, I think the codes can sort of be solved by states or the federal government at some point. It's not as big of a deal, but it's, it's, it certainly needs to be done. It'd be nice to have multiple years, but it's something that Florida and some states have done, not all the states. But on the case law part, what would be nice would be to at least see the federal uh, appellate courts, uh, the state Supreme Courts, put up the final official version of the thing, mm -hmm. at a minimum. And I think they could do that through the licensing agreements that they're making with these other folks. They didn't have to go through some uh, user uh, uh, license, you know, click-through agreement. And I think if they did that, and again, there's a lot of money to spend on litigation. You got the, you got to hit, first you have to get to a conflict, 
and then you've got to hire lawyers, and then you have to file briefs, and you have to argue it, and then you finally get up to an appellate level. Uh, so lots of briefs, lots and lots of work. The actual amount of work that I think it takes to proofread, sort of do the, the, the spell checking, the grammar checking, help. Use Microsoft Word, it does a pretty good job. And then do the uh, uh, cross references and so some of the checking for quotes and things like that. It's really minimal compared to all the amount and expense of the litigation that's taking place. So the question is, how can the courts do that? And I think the courts basically, by, by controlling what is and what isn't the official opinion, can say to whoever they want to be sort of the official publisher, you're going to give us back an official copy of that opinion, maybe without the page numbers, maybe without the parallel citations, if that seems to be a big issue, but at least get the official text of the opinion and put it up on the website, and then let you know folks like, like us or any of the people at publicresource.org who download the, the, the large tar files, take it and do the markup, and I, I think other things like citation stuff, that stuff can resolve, but at least get the official text of the opinion itself, and that's something which I've not seen, and maybe I'm not sure what your, your thoughts are on that, but that seems to be the big thing on the case law. Well, I think actually I'd, I'd take it further. I mean, I, it's a 10-year-old problem again. Um, we have Ed Jessen come and talk to our guys at a research class. Uh, he's the California Reporter of Decisions. You know? And he talks about how, well, there's two different versions, and you know, we have the kind of Lexus, but I think they might, uh, they might scrape off the first one, and then there might be a second one. Uh, you know, we're not sure exactly, and if you compare, it might not be exactly the same. Now, some of these are tiny differences that don't really matter very much. But the courts have the whip hand here. I mean, if, if you could mobilize somehow the judiciary, they could require citation by a paragraph. They could change the entire uh, universe. They could demand whatever they want. The thing is to get them motivated, and that's what, that's what I see as the basic problem. It's very hard to get courts and the court structure But do you think they would be competent to do that? I mean, do you think that if they, if they were motivated, that the government would be competent to actually put up the official opinions? Or do you feel like this really needs to be something done by uh, private commercial public? Well, I mean, to this point, I'm, you've only been able to trust commercial ventures. I'm just cynical about the ability of government to operate very well. I mean, I, I was really hard with sec the Secretary of State, who I'd be happy to vote for for governor. Um, because, I mean, like, no, given the track record of the federal government on this and the various state governments as they come and go, I just don't view them as reliable partners to lean on. Yeah. The other thing you were talking about was even if you've got the same copy of the same opinion, people have this view that Lexus Westlaw are um, more authoritative. So you have so one of the things that you probably also need is a way for um, the the web the various websites that are hosting the opinion to mark that their product is the same as the West the Westlaw Lexus product. Just um, authentic. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just I mean it's the same problem that that, uh, that I'm sure Chris will talk about in terms of privacy of like if you can find a badge to say you know. This is just as good as that other thing, or it's the same ingredients as in Pepsi or whatever it is, right? Uh, but you know, part of your problem there is that paranoia, and you can yep. see that paranoia when you talked about the municipal code, or or the you know the, the websites that say, well, we this is an electronic representation of the information, but don't take it to the bank if it really counts. We we're not holding the bag on this one, and then they don't even have a paper version. It's just <laughs> it's just this general paranoia and fear of attack. Well, yeah, I always cover your ass. I always feel heartened when I can tell that someone has cut and pasted out of Westlaw onto the web, because I know that at least they got it from that other thing that people paid for. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 was, I actually was on a mission about this uh, about 15 years ago, about getting authentic information. And I got myself appointed to the American Law Institute. And I went to the American Law Institute and said, you know, will you, I try to think, what's the most uh, sort of prestigious blue ribbon nonpartisan organization you can get to, 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 to authenticate stuff? Set up a way to authenticate information. And of course, I'm sure it's different now because I stopped going to the meetings, but the, the board were all septuagenarians and octogenarians, <laughs> and they all said, well, that's a wonderful idea. I think they're still having that same. Yeah, so, um, so, and so I couldn't find. I mean, what we that's what we need someone to authenticate, someone to just say yes, this is a version that should be relied upon by everybody. So let, let me make two points. Um, one that I think is very important is that there's always going to be room for a company that's got boots on the ground, that's got hundreds of lawyers scrubbing the cases and adding value, and that's why I say this really is an opportunity for the established vendors. Uh, for authentication, um, I, I think that's one of those areas where technology has begun to move along. And when you look at the current system and say, why is it so broken? It's so broken because that's just the way the world has been. And we now have some opportunities in front of us. Um, if you look at the Federal Register, for example, um, a lot of people have assisted the Office of the Federal Register in their new XML release. And they did two things. 
Uh, they made bulk data available for free. It used to be $17,000 a year. But most importantly, they are digitally signing a PDF version of the Federal Register. Now, that doesn't mean that you have a digital signature on the XML, and if someone uses those you know, words out of the XML and puts them someplace else, maybe it's right, maybe it isn't, right? You might trust West or Lexus much more. But if you really care, you can go back to the government pull up that PDF and it's been digitally signed and you can verify that that document is the same. And what that's done is produce opportunities for small vendors and nonprofits to work with this material and do things. Uh, maybe someday compete with West, but maybe not. But at the very least, the public interest applications and, and the nonprofit applications and the legal research applications are possible. Whereas at $17,000 a year for the Federal Register, they weren't possible. It was out of our price range. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next panel now, which is um, the technical... <laughs>